people believe that comedy, stand-up comedy, and planning are actually intrinsically linked. We actually think these two worlds are pretty entwined. There's a kind of symbiotic relationship that exists between the two. And being better at stand-up actually makes you a better planner, and vice versa. So we're going to go about talking about that. Now, I know you're probably some advertising, marketing, brand-style people, so you might be a bit cynical, maybe a bit disbelieving. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is try and prove it to you, to arrest that cynicism. The other thing with advertising people, we like to nick stuff, we like to thieve little bits that we take back. Uh, well, the good news is we've got a whole bundle of things that we can physically nick from stand-up comedy. Uh, to kick things off, I'm all over the place. This is going to happen. To kick things off, Fraser is going to help explain how we prove this theory. Okay, so there are three basic processes in terms of writing a joke and telling it on stage. And funnily enough, those three processes are exactly the same that we do within planning. And so I'm going to talk you through both these processes and we can actually prove that there is a connection. And I'm going to do this with the help of our friends at Harvey Nichols. Now, your investor told me that I have to explicitly say that Harvey Nichols are not a sponsor and they definitely have not given James and I £100 to spend at their wonderful department store this Christmas if we feature them in the presentation. That did not happen. Thanks for telling me. Yeah, just to be clear, it didn't happen. So, Harvey Nichols, um, a big department store, and at Christmas time, they sell a lot of beans. And the reason that they sell a lot of beans is because of beans. Christmas parties. So this is like the Hollow Christmas Party circuit 2007. That's it's gone back. <laughs> there we go. Hollow Christmas Party 2007 was a nightmare. The girl at the end got completely drunk. Crappy night. Um, so, they know that a lot of women are going to be buying new dresses for the Christmas party, so it's a great opportunity for them. So what they want to do is come up with a campaign that makes these women want to spend more on a Harvey Nichols dress. So, what they start to do is look for an insight around the Christmas party that they can latch onto and pull it back round to Harvey Nichols. Now, they could think, oh, maybe we can do something around wanting to look good for that inevitable photocopy moment that's going to happen. Or maybe you want to look good so you can snog the new guy in the post room. Or maybe we could do a campaign around being better than Edna, who turns up to every Christmas party looking fantastic, but not this year, this year could be your year. So all of these are things that they can latch onto. But they're really tired and they're really well trodden, and so they won't really resonate as well. So what they've done, gone to do is look for something else that connects to the Christmas party. And what they've hit upon is the Walk of Shame. Now, hands up who knows what the Walk of Shame is. Yeah, a few people. Keep your hands up if you've done the Walk of Shame. <laughs> well, two very honest people. I expected no one. If we could get some lights on that, that would be brilliant. Okay, right, well, for everyone else that um, doesn't know what the Walk of Shame is, uh, you don't need to listen to this. Just you. <laughs> Angry birds or something. Um, so everyone doesn't know what a walk of shame is, I'm going to try and explain it in uh, the most decent way I can. Good. Okay. Uh, so, picture the scenario. Uh, a girl's gone out, she's in a wonderful evening dress, she's going to the office party, she uh, hooks up with a guy that she wasn't expected to, she goes back to his, and then the next day she has to walk through town in the morning, full on evening dress, thus signifying to everyone else that she uh, didn't go home. Excellent. Uh, nice way of saying it. Perfect. <laughs> so, they put up on the walk of shame, but that in itself is not a great insight for them to build. It's just a scenario. So the next step is to really craft that insight into something that will pay back to Harvey Nichols and motivate women to go and buy dresses for them. So, let's look at the situation of the walk of shame. Uh, what they did was go, right, we know this happens, but what are women thinking, feeling, and doing at this time? And as the name suggests, they're thinking of shame. <laughs> now, Harvey Nichols have thought to themselves, do you know what, we can play a role here, because they don't have to think of shame. Actually, if you're wearing a Harvey Nichols dress, you're looking amazing in the evening, and you're looking amazing the next day. So that's what you should be, that's how we can do it. That we can create a real role for office parties, walk of shame, look amazing. Now, this to me is brilliant thing. But brilliant thinking in and of itself is not the end result because what you have to do is deliver that to two very important groups of people. Firstly, you have to get clients to realise how amazing this is and go with it. And secondly, you need consumers to kind of engage with it and go, okay, that's spot on. So the delivery of it is really important. 
Now, I wasn't in the pitch for this, uh, but I imagine it was very logical, uh, very passionate, and kind of built up this big revelation of this is something that we can do differently and own. But what we do have is the actual delivery to the to people. And that's based around advertising 101, what can I steal? 
And how can this benefit me? It's a bit libelous, though. <laughs> That's what we do at Hollow anyway. We, just, we don't do that. We do. Um, it's just there. So we're going to talk you through five things that you can steal from stand-up comedy right now and take back into the agency. So good news. Uh, the first of five, we can steal their insight. What could be better? Now to demonstrate this, we're going to focus on this little fella, the humble biscuit. Now, in England at least, the, the, the purpose of the biscuit, the raison d'etre of the biscuit, is to be dunked. To be dunked in a cup of tea. How dunkable that biscuit is, how nice it is when it's been dunked, that's a big deal around that biscuit. So if you were a brand called Rich Tea, for example, you'd think they would be the dunk masters. They would be king of the dunk. They know a lot about dunking. That's what you would assume. Um, unfortunately, that isn't or wasn't the case. And actually, as a brand, there was still something they needed to own, they needed to find, and what was it that could really connect them with the audience? Now, of course, as a brand, within advertising, what do you do? Well, you do all your desk research, don't you? You do your focus group up and down the land. You do vox box on the street. You pour over the data and the statistics, and you really look to try and find, what can it be? Where can I uncover that insight? You can do all of that, or you can go to YouTube and stick in rich tea and steal from there. Give it any rich tea you've seen in Britain, give it to that. Give it a spice of God, though. You never get used to that. As you get older and you dip your biscuit in it, because you don't know when it's going to fall. Then you panic. When it's got its head, it's like going to pop it. Fly slow motion. Need a 
steel ingredients is the way that they highlight their punchlines. And they do this so well. They will spend months crafting a joke that could be told in 10 seconds. But what they do is they really build up to it so well to make the end point more dramatic and more emotional for the person listening. And this is one of the finest examples. Uh, yeah, on one occasion, worse even than that, right? Um, if, I, if I tell you this thing, right, after I've told you, don't judge me and think, oh, what a dickhead, right? Remember, that was me that told you. The only reason you know is because I've told you, right? So remember, they think, oh, it's superior, we've got one all over. No, I told you this thing, alright? It's embarrassing. <laughs> there was a time during sex where I accidentally, accidentally, my off, I did. <laughs> a little bit, accidentally, a little bit, put on an American accent. <laughs> so, as planners, we have punchlines. And so, there's times we'll spend weeks crafting an insight and then to just deliver it very quickly just wouldn't really give it the impact that it deserves. And so what we should always do is look at what our punchlines are and build up to them and celebrate them. So as a planner, when we're delivering a core insight, that's a punchline. When we're delivering a core proposition, that's our punchline. When we're delivering a big idea, that's our punchline. And then we can get this, elicit the same emotional response that stand-up comedians do when they build up to their punchlines. Our final thing that we can feed, I did say final, we're not far away from the end now, you're nearly at the beer stage. Our final thing we can feed, you all already know, we absolutely guarantee it. This is the rule of three. This is what we've frankly been born into, we've grown up as part of our psyche, as part of our culture, from Goldlocks and the three bears to the three little pigs to an Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman. We all understand the kind of grammar and format of things delivered in threes. This trio, this triptych notion is something we embrace and we engage with. And it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy when it's delivered, as three, we simply engage with it better because we've always known it in that sense. And just as 300 years ago, when the Englishman, Irishman, and Scotsman jokes were first starting, they are just as effective as they are today. Don't get the wrong idea. You know, I'm a very gay-friendly act. I was up as last year to judge Mr. Gay UK. I said, no problem at all. He's against nature, against God, he's going to hell. <laughs> Ladies, if you get a burning sensation when you pee, it could be one of three things. It could be cystitis, it could be a bushfire, <laughs> or could be someone's talking about you, the JJ. So it works brilliantly comedy. Do you know what works well in advertising too? Surprise, surprise. And Ian Glide amongst you might have noticed that we've even built out that bit into three parts. Uh, so we're at least practicing what we preach. And then I put in a heckler slide just for you. Yeah, so I thought you'd made for that point, so I was going to bring this on the back of you see. I didn't need to. No, we'll skip over it. We're in the summary bit now. Um, where we've actually got three summary points. Who would have guessed? Um, the first one is go and see as much stand-up as you can. But do it in, don't do it in a passive way. Do it in a way that they can sit up. Try and spot the little tips and tricks and nuances that they do. And actually pull them back into your world. Because as I said, we've only given you five and there are hundreds. And in fact, the reason we've only given five is because James and I are trying to turn this into a book. So, you know, be mindful. Uh, if you want to find out the rest, you can keep going to see standard comedy, or you can just buy our book that's out next year. In Harvey Nichols. In Harvey Nichols, a very good bookshop. The second uh, of our little takeouts, of our little summary points, is um, why don't you do what he did, what he inflicted on his planning team, and get them an open mic night at a local kind of comedy club. Get them to actually do this thing for real. Now, uh, they might hate you for it, you might have resource issues when one or two of them kind of leave, but, you know, Billy Bonus has got a fun night out to laugh at. Most importantly, though, we absolutely guarantee that you're going to have a bunch of planners who, whilst learning the discipline of stand-up comedy, are going to get an awful lot better at the planning book. I can tell you from experience, they will hate you. Uh, and finally, if this guy comes up to your agency with a CV in a suit demanding a job, don't get security to walk him away straight away. Uh, it's probably an unlikely situation to ever happen. Uh, but if it did, he could be the best planner that you ever hire. Because he's already got the processes in place to become a great planner. And that's why, vice versa, at Holler, every single planner that we employ, because all of our offices now does standard training across four weeks, and does a real life gig in a comedy club. And we're already seeing the benefits. 
So it's something that I would recommend you all do as well. That's all from us. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the day.